Okay. Uh, good morning uh, to our friends in Europe, and also, of course, uh, good afternoon uh, to our Chinese audience, and also, of course, to the uh, friends uh, and audience uh, uh, around the world, probably, if there's any. And uh, so, welcome to this section of the WTO Public Forum, uh, Building Trade Resilience for Sustainable uh, Development. And uh, uh, my name is uh, Henry Hui Yao Wang, the, the founder and the president of Center for China and Globalization. And uh, also, this section is co organized by uh, CCG and All China Environment Federation. So, welcome all of you. So we actually, uh, as we all know, we're living a fragmented world now as, uh, as globalization is really uh, having a lot of challenges uh, with, with the trend of, uh, of uh, anti-globalization prevailing and also multilateral system of global governance is in, uh, in, is in uh, uh, slowing down and even in crisis sometime. Uh, we actually want to find what are the really uh, most uh, uh, you know, important and maybe also low-hand food that we can tackle this. And I think plastic promotion, pollution is, is one of the most uh, pressing global issues, uh, especially considering our common challenge. Uh, climate change actually is, is uh, highly related with this. So our shared goal of working towards a sustainable recovery uh, and also in the, in the post-pandemic uh, 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 times, the, the volume of plastic waste is uh, continue to grow. And uh, yet, according to UNEP, only 9% of the plastic waste has been produced, uh, uh, has been actually, uh, you know, uh, really has been handled. So, so building a more environmental friendly solution for plastics requires uh, not only public private partnership, but also joint initiative from uh, stakeholders from all different sectors, including NGOs and international organizations, uh, particularly like uh, WTO. Uh, uh, so this is highly relevant that we're having this uh, uh, topic today. So in today's section, we'll explore more ways and mechanism in tackling the global issue of plastic promotion, pollution and advanced proposals for more enhanced role of WTO in promoting sustainable plastic trade. So plastic is also heavily traded. I'm actually happy, <laughs> very honored to introducing our panelists. Today we gathered very uh, highly distinguished uh, panelists today uh, from uh, different uh, parts of the world and also representing different uh, sectors. Uh, Ambassador uh, Chad Blackman, a permanent representative above others to the UN and the WTO. And also Dr. Caroline, uh, Break back, uh, director of a forum of trade environment and SDGs. I remember uh, uh, <laughs> working with uh, Dr. Brickback, uh, you know, two years ago, and uh, we actually had a, a WTO <laughs> a public uh, uh, seminar. Actually, uh, starting to really pay more attention on this issue, and also we are uh, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Uh, Zhang Nanqin, uh, secretary general of a community of green, circular, and inclusive, and also she's from Old China Environment Protection Federation. And also, of course, uh, uh, Ms. Judy Russell, Senior Pop, uh, Public Affairs Manager, uh, Packaging and Sustainability at the Nestle. So, so we have really a great <laughs> uh, panelist uh, today. Uh, the, the panel, actually the scope of our discussion today, uh, we would like to cover some of the areas. Uh, I would like to maybe just propose that. Uh, what is the nature of the plastic uh, trade and how does it affect existing trade related measures uh, to reduce plastic pollution and waste? What are the gaps and limitations in current efforts? So that's one, one aspect uh, that we could hope that our panel can share some uh, uh, ideas on that. And also second is how improve the trade cooperation with, within the rules of a mechanism of the WTO would contribute to the domestic regional and global efforts to achieve SDGs. So particularly WTO, we are having a WTO forum. So this is really very important for WTO member countries to, to think about. How would the environment agenda factor in WTO reform 
and what are the pro prospects and the challenges? Again, uh, related with WTO. So what's the uh, agenda on this? And what role, and of course we have a, a, a panelist from China too. So what role can China play in promoting trade policies conducive to the environment? So that, that just uh, some of the questions uh, that uh, we, we have in mind. Of course, we are, we are open to other issues uh, and, and the discussions as well. So perhaps, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm Ambassador uh, Chad Blackman is, uh, is, is on, and, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, you know, if not, I, 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 I think, Caroline, maybe you can also I, start. I, I, oh, yeah, you are, great, great. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador, Your Excellency. Uh, you, are, you are very familiar with the issue. Maybe you can uh, uh, open, in, open this panel uh, discussion. Uh, Ambassador uh, Blackman, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, by starting, I just want to put it into uh, context. Of course, trading plastics is a trillion dollar industry. It contributes to millions of jobs in many developing countries as well, serving as an, uh, an avenue to diversify the economies and shifting to higher value added production. A growing number of developing countries, of course, are crucial suppliers of inputs into the global plastics industry. For example, the oil and natural gas sectors, where 99.5% of plastics are known to be derivative of petrochemicals. Now, to put it into further perspective, developing countries are amongst those that have been most negatively impacted by plastics pollution. The tourism sector, on which many developing countries depend, including a number of small island developing states, is sensitive to issues which alter the pristine nature of such a product. As part of their climate adaptation and mitigation commitments, their obvious need to conserve the planet in an effort to stem the impact of climate change countries have been actively seeking to highlight the challenges created by plastics. There are calls within the international environment discussions for a global treaty on plastic, as well as efforts made within multilateral environmental agreements to dialogue and amend existing agreements to include for standards or bans on plastic. Now, during the conference of the parties of the Basel Convention in 2019, governments amended the convention to include plastic waste in a legally binding framework, thereby making global trade in plastic waste more transparent and better regulated, as well as to ensure that the management of plastic waste is safer for human health and also the environment. The partnership on plastic waste has also been established with an aim to rally stakeholders to implement the new measures and also to provide technical and financial assistance support to developing countries. Now, in an effort to stymie the impact of Plastic, a group of WTO members launched the informal dialogue on plastics pollution and environmentally sustainable plastics trade. This initiative has thus far explored how the WTO can contribute to strengthening policy coherence, collective approaches amongst members, and improving technical assistance to developing countries in support of global efforts to reduce plastic waste and to move towards a circular plastics economy. WTO members have also been implementing trade-related measures which seek to reduce plastic pollution, such as through import restrictions. A number of these countries have been on the forefront of imposing and notifying bans on single-use plastics, for example, my own country, Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. There are considered efforts being made to transition to more efficient and environmentally friendly alternative to plastics whilst transitioning away from the excessive use of plastic into new alternatives does not come without its own complexities and challenges, there is a significant scope to benefit from these new economic opportunities. Countries have therefore moved towards more sustainable products like glass, pottery, ceramics, natural fibers, and paper. It is clear that there is a need for a balanced approach to mainstreaming environment and trade policy as it relates to plastic a core part of which will need to be cooperation between international organizations like the United Nations Environment Program and the World Trade Organization, as well as the provision of capacity and financial assistance to developing countries that need it most. To this end, I urge that more countries uh, should co-sponsor the informal dialogue on plastics pollution and environmentally sustainable plastics trade. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Blackman. And uh, it's really uh, great that uh, uh, you emphasize this uh, importance of, of, of this issue and how we can really uh, work together on that and uh, uh, you know, really uh, you know, take uh, uh, concrete actions. So, so it's good to have you open that. And uh, uh, now I'd like to uh, have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Brinkback, uh, <laughs> Caroline, I mean, you and I, we were actually uh, 2019, we, we in Geneva at the public forum, we actually jointly hold a, a, a seminar on, on this issue. So I remember then, I mean, this was really uh, that uh, high tension given to this topic. But now after two years, I think particularly, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, the world is more uh, consensus now, uh, con conscious now on the, on the climate change. I mean, you know, at least for WTO and, and also the, the using and banning and of course uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, trade this uh, plastic thing and there's a host of things that we could look at. So perhaps uh, uh, that you can give a bit of the a perspective of the new plastic <laughs> economy and how we can really uh, this plastic supply chain and upstream problem and solutions and of course uh, the, the partnership between WTO and IGO and NGO, uh, uh, such as UAEP as well. So, so of course, you, you, you've been uh, expert in this area for, for watching for a long time now. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brickback, it's your turn, please. Great, thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction. I'm just trying to share my slides, but it doesn't seem actually that it's possible. So I will proceed uh, without them, which is fine. So um, the first thing that I wanted to mention um, today is, um, well, firstly, I wanted to thank Ambassador Blackman for putting the, um, the issue so well in context, because of course, there's a really strong environment dimension to this issue of trade and plastic pollution, but there's also a really important development dimension about how we move to a more environmentally uh, sustainable plastics trade and how we use trade policies in a way um, that are both effective and also fair in addressing uh, plastic pollution. So the first point that I just wanted to underline is that uh, on context is that uh, plastic production is growing enormously. It's grown enormously over the last 50 years and we're expecting it to quadruple by 2050. So this is in terms of the supply side or the upstream end, we're gonna have more and more and more plastic in the global economy in the coming, in the coming years if, if we continue business as usual. There are um, efforts now to recognize that we have a plastic pollution problem at the waste end of the plastic life cycle. In, and, and that is obviously a major contributor to ocean and marine plastic pollution. But there are also environmental issues along the life cycle of plastic from those associated with fossil fuel extraction to the carbon intensity of plastic production, um, chemicals that are used in the plastic production processes and the impacts that they may have on communities living around um, plastic production facilities, and also the, um, the health impacts on, on those who at the waste end of the life cycle um, are affected by, community, uh, by um, plastic waste in their communities and so on, and also in their field. So for developing countries, even those who have no coastal um, uh, environments in, within their national territories, plastic pollution can still be a huge issue because it clogs up sewage, it clogs up um, public infrastructure, it clogs up water streams, and it's pervasive in agricultural fields, which impacts agricultural productivity as well. So there's a range of reasons why we should care about plastic pollution and the new, the latest discussions among governments for this new UN environment. Uh, a global agreement on plastic pollution is really um, has really underlined the need to take a life cycle approach. So that means looking downstream and also what we can do upstream to um, address pollution upstream, but also recognizing that even if we were only concerned about the downstream issues, we would need to look upstream as well to look at the way that plastics are designed, the, the range of types of plastics that we have on the market, how we can reduce unnecessary use of plastic in products um, and how we can make sure that they are as recyclable and reusable as possible. So this upstream part is really critical to solving the downstream um, issue. So just to touch quickly on the trade dimension, of course, we have trade across the life cycle of plastics from fossil fuel feedstocks to virgin primary plastics where over 50% of production is traded internationally. We have trade in, in plastic packaging, um, both in its own right as 
empty packaging and also packaging that's associated with prepackaged products and also used in transportation and distribution. Um, and we also have millions of products that have plastics embedded in them, but that are difficult to trace um, in international trade statistics because they're not plastic products per se. They may be a car or they may be uh, a phone or household furniture, all kinds of other form um, uh, products in which we have plastic. And of course, there's trade in plastic waste. You now, in a study that we did last year with Angtad, we showed that um, there's over a trillion uh, dollars in plastics trade. Um, that's probably an underestimate because there's many types of plastic that flows across borders that we can't measure well. Um, so it's more than 5% of the total value of global trade. Of that um, trillion dollars, only 3 billion of it is trade in plastic waste. And this doesn't mean we should underestimate the importance of that volume of plastic waste being traded internationally and to ensure that it's, it's managed in an environmentally sound fashion. But it means that we've just got this other trillion dollars worth of trade in plastics that we need to understand better and understand where and how trade policy can help us push it in a direction that is more environmentally sustainable. Um, and problem at the moment is we have a lot missing in terms of international trade cooperation on plastic. So we have this new plastic waste amendments to the Basel Convention that Ambassador Blackman mentioned. Um, but it really just tackles the waste end of this of the of international plastic trade. So there's a lot more work to be done in terms of data and monitoring of trade flows to understanding their relevance to efforts to reduce plastic pollution. Many countries are implementing um, important national responses, as Ambassador Blackman mentioned, but they're developed in an uncoordinated and disjointed manner, which can reduce effectiveness. Uh, many of the exporters and companies that are trying to, to move towards greater sustainability face a really complex and divergent regulatory framework. And there's often poor transparency of what the sustainability standards are that you have to meet um, in order to trade internationally. We also have a lack of policy coherence that um, many countries are designing very ambitious domestic measures around plastic pollution, but they're not coupled um, with appropriate or with um, aligned trade policy measures. And finally, across this area, we've got too little attention to the challenges and opportunities facing developing countries on trade related aspects of tackling plastic pollution, on the challenges of transformation and a just transition. And a, a key issue here is to note, as Ambassador Blackman has, that many countries are investing in different aspects of the plastic supply chain as a way to, a div to um, diversify economically and also to add value to their exports. So as we move to transition, we have to make sure uh, that we find ways um, to ensure that they're not unfairly disadvantaged. I've just got uh, two quick points uh, to go. The first is that there are many different pathways for this cooperation. We can cooperation, cooperate on trade through UN environmental processes, such as the Basel Convention and UNEA. Um, we can do so regionally. We can do so in co collaboration with businesses and NGOs that are in favor of a new circular plastics economy. But we can also do it at the WTO, as Ambassador Blackman has mentioned. So I think this informal dialogue on plastic pollution um, at the WTO is a really critical way that we can spur and catalyze discussion among members on the various options that they have at hand for tackling this. And I would hope in going forward that we can not only focus on sharing experiences and promoting transparency, but really looking for concrete actions um, that countries could take and that could pledge, they could pledge to work on together voluntarily through cooperation at the WTO, I think that would be a really great step forward. And as I fear I'm speaking too long, I won't go now into my specific recommendations, but hopefully in the discussion, I could come back and tell you what I think some of the, the key things that could actually be done in the WTO context that would make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Van. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, Caroline, and uh, for your for your great uh, intervention as well. I think, yeah, you have been uh, giving a lot of a uh, uh, great, great perspective uh, into this uh, very uh, urgent issue. I think that uh, it's high time that uh, all the countries and uh, particularly WTO uh, that we can really work together on this issue. I think uh, uh, this is something, uh, as you said, you know, has been explosive growth of uh, production growth and, and even trading. Uh, yet we really haven't found a, in fact, a way of uh, how we can really better uh, contain this, uh, uh, you know, pollution of, of, of this plastic. So, so absolutely very important, but also a very uh, key area that we can start with. So, so thank you. We'd like to hear from you uh, later as well. Now, I would like to also uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Jiang Nanqin uh, to, to, to speak.
She's, uh, 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 of course, an uh, expert in, in uh, environment protection, but uh, also knowledgeable on China. I mean, as, as uh, we know that China's current plastic recycling industry uh, is, is also uh, developing and gaps and, uh, and, and also where can we really fit that in and between national and global trade policy uh, in plastics and business perspectives and uh, China's experience in global trade. Uh, regarding the plastic, so so uh, uh, Dr. Jiang, you 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 are the expert. I'd like to hear from you uh, for this discussion, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, panelists. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm based. Uh, I'm working in, in this uh, plastic issue and the recycling sector in the past those three years. Uh, so here, I would like to address. Uh, uh, on the recycling sector in China and also uh, the uh, status that now China, what, what's going on uh, for the international society to have more understanding. Uh, I think usually uh, people know uh, that China is the largest uh, uh, plastic uh, production and, and the consumption uh, country and the China banned uh, uh, imported waste plastic uh, since uh, 2000. Uh, 18. Uh, so the sector, uh, the recycling sector and the whole country really are moving, uh, making a lot of uh, changes. Uh, so now um, with, uh, with now each country is, uh, has to deal with their own waste plastic. Uh, but now there are still a lot of uh, international trade uh, on uh, recycled plastic and also like uh, the the uh, all the packagings and all the material used uh, of uh, plastic. So still a huge uh, trade uh, floor and volume uh, in, in globally. Um, so uh, the, there's a function of a uh, trade uh, to promote uh, plastic uh, recycling is uh, very important, especially now in this uh, uh, climate uh, change, uh, like country like China also announced uh, uh, carbon neutral by uh, 2060. So um, now this brings uh, a, a more opportunities and potential for a recycling sector that could have much uh, carbon reduction. Uh, in for recycling, we we know that uh, circular economy is a is a perfect approach uh, of uh, uh, having this uh, closed loop. Um, but uh, uh, plastic is always not easy to to recycle uh, and, and to return because uh, many are used as a single use uh, plastic, such as uh, uh, packaging and this uh, agri in agriculture. Yeah, uh, so it is very um, a more important, like how to have the consumers to return it and uh, uh, back to the value chain and how to empower the value chain of getting more and more important. Um, so now the Chinese uh, recycling sector, the entrepreneurs in, in this sector are making a uh, big efforts uh, to uh, have more uh, low value uh, waste plastic uh, to be collected uh, and to be used like a PT or HDPE and uh, PP. And then uh, having them uh, to be sorted into different qualities, into different values, uh, different levels, and then uh, uh, at the, the end, they are making, trying to make it more into a uh, high value, uh, high added value uh, products. Like uh, now uh, also trying to uh, make a direct, uh, more short, uh, a closed loop, the more a short pass of a closed loop, such as making into a, a from bottle to bottle, uh, from textile to textile, uh, from carpet to carpet. Uh, this uh, really can save a lot of uh, resource consumption and make more uh, short, direct shortcut of uh, applications, but which uh, also means uh, it really uh, needs higher, a uh, much higher uh, recycling system. Uh, the quality, like from bottle to bottle, uh, this also need to be a close uh, collection of uh, the uh, the uh, of a bottles, PT bottles from. Car 
carpet to carpet uh, needs to be more like a single material or like made of uh, 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 also PET or uh, HDPE. And also this needs uh, uh, the change from the upstream from design design side to really have all these uh, used as a single material and have uh, also easy to separate. Um, so, and also the policy uh, level, the support is also very uh, necessary as uh, 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 as China banned the, the imported plastic, so the recycling sector also need to uh, set up their own recycling system. So uh, which uh, where they can get the profits from this uh, system. So policy level like China is making, uh, is having, these uh, non-waste city uh, and uh, now uh, to ban this single-use uh, plastic, all the policies and also to set up the green uh, circular and the low carbon uh, is a, a system all helping to uh, the whole society to get involved. Um, so now the, the Chinese sector now uh, now our uh, business is uh, having these uh, more applications uh, like working, collaborating with uh, branding companies and uh, uh, to have more uh, recycled uh, uh, improvement modification of uh, plastic into a high value like used in uh, automobiles, in textile to have these more high value, uh, high value added uh, uh, products. And now also, textile and uh, uh, these uh, single use films can also be used uh, to be to be cleaned and then uh, uh, to have more more is uh, a cheap uh, to have a cheaper cost of uh, resource uh, the sources um, and also for Chinese uh, uh, recycling system uh, also uh, we are also the uh, the largest uh, sector in, in the world so we are also help uh, also going abroad a lot. Uh, like many Chinese uh, businesses are investigating in Southeast Asia and also in Europe and US and Japan. Uh, also, they are having this uh, label, labeling uh, marine like to save, uh, to reduce more marine pollutions. And uh, um, also uh, the most significant sector is uh, our recycling uh, machine uh, equipment manufacturing sector, which is also exported like over 160 countries in the world. So now for the media and the uh, lower level of all these uh, machine machines equipments are mainly are made in China and also some Chinese uh, companies uh, manufacturing uh, business can also have some uh, high advanced uh, uh, level into more high qualities. Uh, so, uh, but this is uh, not uh, enough. Uh, it needs the whole whole chain to be connected uh, with uh, with policies uh, like from and also the uh, from design side from technology and the supply chain are, are making uh, changes. So um, for further uh, collaboration, uh, we feel like all the stakeholders uh, to collaborate is very important. Uh, so we need to and for the global trade of uh, these plastic is used uh, in all sort, uh, all everywhere in our lifestyle. So we need to really set up the, the platform uh, with the digital quantity like measures. Uh, so here like carbon, carbon reduction uh, standards labels will be important as they have uh, relevant with, uh, with the carbon reduction and also uh, with uh, with the, can be linked very much to the carbon market. So I think in the future, we work on this to have more digitalized uh, platform for to uh, promote a recycled plastic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. I think that, uh, yeah, you spoke uh, uh, from a uh, uh, China practice point of view. I mean, as you mentioned, China is uh, you know, one of the largest uh, plastic uh, producers, but also users. And, and of course, also, I think the policy now China, Chinese government taking like a, a few years, two years, three years back, that not uh, taking a plastic uh, baggage and, and uh, luggage and things like that is really uh, uh, important. And now we, uh, it's very consensus. I think something that if Chinese government has made the mind to do, 
uh, it's really uh, can uh, can turn things around. I'm, I'm also uh, very pleased to see uh, actually President Xi mentioned at the UN uh, General Assembly just recently that China is no longer uh, building fossil uh, fire pl power plants uh, outside China. So that's a great commitment. So, so I really hope that with China going to, as the biggest plastic uh, producing country, but also uh, now uh, we are very interested to, to have international consensus to build up this, uh, 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 you know, preventing plastic uh, pollution uh, international uh, consensus. That's really important. That's exactly uh, the, the, the discussion we're having now to, to really build up this consensus. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang. And, uh, and now I would like to hear from a, a business representative, uh, Ms. Judy uh, Russell, I mean, you you representing a, a well-known uh, multinational. And uh, so how does the uh, CSR and plastic uh, best, best practices applied? And, and last is plastic corporate strategy and, uh, and of course, plastic policy input from industry. So, so we, we'd love to know all those, uh, uh, you know, from industry point of view, we had the uh, ambassador saying from, from the government, from international agency, we had uh, Caroline mentioned from, uh, uh, you know, from academic, and, and of course we have uh, uh, Dr. John talk about from an uh, association point of view, but uh, and, and Jill, maybe now uh, it's industry, which we, I think all the players are important, we cannot uh, 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 live without them. So so now, uh, uh, Dr. No, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Russell, your turn, please. Thanks very much, Dr. Wong. It's a pleasure to join you today. Um, as, as you noted in your introduction, I'll talk a little bit about our corporate strategy and how Nestle sees the question of managing plastics footprint, um, share some best practices, um, some that we've developed, some that we support and have joined, and look also at some, some reflections um, from, from where we sit as a, a multinational company that's active in 186 countries in terms of managing our supply chains, our footprint. Um, and, um, and some reflections on how the trade system can support building a better system. Um, in terms of the plastic packaging waste problem, I think that um, the ambassador and, and Dr. Birkbeck spoke very eloquently about the problem. This accumulation of plastic waste on land, in rivers, in oceans is endangering environmental sustainability. And it's an urgent priority for us and a responsibility that we take very seriously. Um, our long-term vision is that none of our packaging will end up in litter, as litter, or in landfills. And we started working with other companies on corporate commitments. Two of the commitments we've made for 2025 are that 100% of our packaging will be recyclable or reusable, and will reduce our use of virgin plastics by 33% by 2025. Now, for us, the challenge of packaging is very much a challenge of fit-for-purpose food-grade packaging. We need to deliver safe and nutritious food and beverages, and the packaging needs to be adapted to product and geography. Different products are sensitive to humidity, to temperature, climate variations, different routes to market, whether that may be an, an air-conditioned big box store, a local retailer, or a stand in a market. And we need to respond to national legislation and labeling requirements. So when we look at our strategy, um, this is in really three thematic areas, less packaging, better materials and a better system. So with less packaging, we're working on packaging reduction and elimination. This is about sourcing new materials, particularly paper and fibers, sourcing recycled plastics, as well as designing packaging that uses less material overall. Secondly, we're looking at reusable packaging systems. How can we deliver packaging that used to be single serving, actually in a single serving reusable container, a multi-serving reusable container, or even bulk refill? And this requires significant rethink of supply chains and reverse logistics. And in both of those areas, there are opportunities for the trade community. Um, the middle theme, better materials, this is about materials innovation for recycling and also supporting composting of organic waste. Um, we designed for recycling with a shift both to paperization to facilitate recycling in the paper or fiber stream, or in some cases, for some paper materials that are very heavy in natural fibers, even in the composting stream where it's accepted by industrial composters. We're also looking, as Dr. Zhang alluded, to designing multi-material plastics, redesigning them into single monomaterial plastics to facilitate sorting and recycling. And we've invested, uh, this is a first in the industry, in a research institute with 50 researchers in the Nestle Institute for Packaging Sciences, specifically focusing on materials innovation to ensure a better footprint for our packaging. 
And the third thematic area, the better system. There we're looking at recycling and waste management infrastructure, um, collection, sorting, recycling at scale, as well as external advocacy to transform the policy landscape. We've built partnerships in dozens of countries around the world to support plastic neutrality or collecting on a voluntary basis the same amount of plastic every year through our partnership programs as we put on the market with our sales. And lastly, in the better system, we also recognize that we all need to rethink our behaviors. This is about shifting our mindset and we need to look at how can we engage consumers on this journey? How can we develop new partnerships with retailers to ensure that more sustainable solutions are on their shelves and offered to consumers? Because sometimes those solutions require more space or different dispensing systems. And lastly, with our, our own work in-house employee education, ensuring that our employees are not only informed but can become ambassadors for this transition. And if I share it from a, a contextual reflection, Nestle's made two other major commitments. Um, one of them is our 2050 commitment to net zero emissions for our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Um, this commitment to net zero is requiring substantial changes across our supply chain in all countries of the world that were active. Secondly, two weeks ago, we announced our commitment to regenerative agriculture. And this regenerative journey is something we're starting. We know we don't have all the answers, but we wanted to open the door to working with partners around the world, looking at how we can move beyond sustainability to making regenerative agriculture the basis of our thinking for all of these systemic decisions so that we can ensure that not only from a climate perspective can we stabilize, but from an agricultural and soil health perspective, Nestle is a positive contributor to a sustainable future for food production. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just make some, some brief comments um, on best practices. Um, we are a participant in a series of design rules for packaging, which if you're not familiar with, I, I highly recommend. The Consumer Goods Forum's Golden Design Rules. And these packaging objectives focus on eliminating problematic or unnecessary packaging, increasing recycling value for packaging types that are being recycled at scale today, increasing the value in future recycling systems for systems that haven't yet been built, improving the environmental performance of business to business packaging that's used in the trade system and improving consumer communications. And so there are nine different specific design rules which are available at the Consumer Goods Forum website. Dozens of large multinational companies have signed up to support them. And we see this as a basis for responsible packaging design to support a full life cycle approach to the footprint of packaging. Um, secondly, Nestle has developed our own, what we call the negative list of packaging types that we are phasing out ourselves on a voluntary basis um, and that we've communicated. This may be ranging from oxo-degradable additives in some types of packaging, eliminating dark pigments such as carbon black, prioritizing clear packaging or white packaging to increase recycling value to ensure that our packaging, if it goes into a recycling system, is something that a municipal waste handler will want to receive. We're also looking at a shift toward different combinations of paper and plastic to ensure if there is plastic in a paper product, the percentage is low enough that it's attractive in the paper recycling stream. So those are a highlight of some very specific design rules that now are changing how we design our packaging for every market around the world to start this transition to ensure that more and more of our packaging will be not only recyclable or reusable, but actually will be attractive. Um, maybe I'll, I'll leave most of my recommendations to later, but I, I wanted to, to highlight one um, that, that Carolyn had mentioned, which is this question of how the trade system can support. Um, I think there, there are opportunities already at the national level for individual countries, for example, to um, stop the importation of mixed waste. That's one step that any country can take to support a healthy recycling system and infrastructure development. Uh, with RTAs, we also see opportunities to prioritize certain materials or deprioritize others, like we've chosen to do on a voluntary basis with our negative list to ensure that non-recyclable materials are not being accepted and that countries are not in a difficult position to manage materials they have no recycling infrastructure for. Um, and lastly, on the, the HS code level, um, we are very interested in following the work that's being done, not only to have HS codes that exist today for plastic packaging that's empty and being transported to another country for an import, but the opportunity to have HS codes that include tracking packaging materials that may have 
chocolate milk or soy milk or pea milk or veggie burgers um, or bouillon cubes wrapped in them as they transit across the world that we know how is that food product being wrapped and what is being imported into a country that ultimately needs to be accepted by the waste management system. Um, I have some other reflections I'd be happy to share later, but in the interest of uh, our, our desire to hear questions from the audience, I'll, I'll end my remarks here. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Julie, yeah. Uh, I know that the ambassador, uh, uh, you know, black man has uh, probably uh, some time you know, pressing, but, but I, I, you know, I think that overall we have already uh, four speakers uh, uh, give a very good, uh, uh, you know, cover up of, of, of the issue. But uh, but you know, we have some questions. Of course, so we uh, we have a few on on, on platform. But but also from uh, from myself, I, I I also have a question. Maybe we, before ambassador leave, uh, I'd like to ask that uh, you've been de dedicated to the international development for more than fifteen years, and uh, so what are the major economic obstacles for the for developing countries to handle this plastic problem? Uh, according to your knowledge and, and experience, and of course also WTO, WTOs trying to strike a balance between economic growth and of course uh, environmental sustainability. And, and then if this plastic solution, how can we really build uh, into this global trade policy? And of course, uh, we, we have uh, international uh, commission, conventions, uh, uh, agreements that solve this problem like uh, Brazil Convention and the Stockholm Convention but they're mostly uh, dealing with uh, regulatory plastic waste rather than uh, promoting plastic trade. Uh, so if WTO wants to set up some new rules on plastic trade, uh, so what are the, uh, how does it able plastic trade policy to integrate with the, with the you know, above conventions? So, so we, <laughs> we'd like to pick your wisdom, uh, Ambassador, please. Thank you very much. I'll attempt to uh, answer all three questions in one go. Um, at the heart of all three, though, I think there has to be a relook to see what are the what is the framework guiding the, the use of plastics, particularly in the aspects of trade. And then when you put the microscope uh, towards, uh, for example, developing countries, many of the countries currently and sadly, and I think the point that, that Jody was making is that a lot of the plastic and and because of trade uh, in countries is in circumstances where those countries don't have the facilities or capacity, whether technical or financial, to be able to treat to, to the plastic after the initial use. Now, when you talk about the circular economy, for example, it is a huge industry. It is where we need to go. But there has to be also a level of uh, development assistance for many countries who simply cannot afford to do so because the cost of shifting uh, your economy from what it was to what it should be is incredibly high. But when the governments have, of course, uh, budgetary constraints and other considerations to, to make, these things often uh, go on the back burner, not for any lack of motivation, but simply the capacity to do so. In terms of the issue of uh, the conventions and trade and getting it mainstreamed into, I think, the WTO, for example, cannot do it alone. Governments in that configuration cannot do it alone, of course. The WTO is a regulator of global trade, but a lot of it has to do with the private sector coming on board, which they're already doing, uh, but coming on board even more. Because and I think the point has to be made very clearly to move into the direction where we wanted to go with plastics and ensuring that the environment is not harmed. There has to be a shift in how do we produce these things. And it goes back also to the inventors. And I think that the point uh, Jody was making with regards to the Institute is very good, but how do you also magnify that across the world. Because if you're going to shift from what we currently have, uh, the, the, the product still must be fit for purpose, must still meet market entry requirements um, and not be substandard in any way. So it will call for a level of ingenuity. Equally, the environmentalists also have to ensure that the new products coming out that will be replacing what we were using before um, must not cause any further harm. So there's a, a, a whole of stakeholder approach, if I should use that term, that has to take place and take place very, very soon. Because over the last year, believe it or not, whilst in one respect, many uh, of our countries have experienced a breathing space as it were because of COVID, because of reduced demand. A lot of our landfills, parks, lakes have been uh, filled with, with a lot of plastics because of the heightened use of uh, online services goods are, are arriving in plastic packages. 
So that, again, it comes back to that balance that we have to strike if all of our stakeholders. Unfortunately, I have to run to another engagement, but I really want to say that uh, I'm really heartened by the discussions. I enjoyed the interventions of the other three panelists and to you, Chair, thank you very much. And to our listeners, I hope um, that I was able to contribute to the discourse this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Blackman. You <laughs> made a very good uh, contribution to our discussion. So this is really important to, to hear from your view as well. Uh, so we, we'll continue our, our, our discussion with our remaining uh, uh, panelists. Of course, uh, uh, we, we have, uh, 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 you know, that we have two questions, you know, uh, that I, I picked from, uh, from our platform. You know, they talk about how does the plastic uh, trading factor in the global, overall WTO reform reform agenda and, and, and also given the current predicament of the multilateral trading system is, is refacing, what are some of practical small steps that government and non-government actors can take to advance the plastic agenda? So, so that, that's a, a, a general question that I got. But that, but also, uh, you know, this is probably to all of our panelists. And then there's another one is that how will the ongoing, uh, we have this, uh, uh, you know, geopolitical issues that can you know, really slowing down the multilateral system, how we can, WTO can really get its act together uh, to promote that. Uh, so those are the two questions I got, you know, for, 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 for all our panelists to think about. But, that, but I, I'd also like to go to uh, uh, Dr. Caroline uh, uh, Brickbank as well. Uh, as uh, as uh, Ambassador mentioned, there are several conventions addressing plastic problem, but, uh, but you lead a partnership program between the uh, 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 Graduate Institute and uh, UNDP, and so can you tell us the the roles that uh, WTO play as one of the most important organization in global governance of trade uh, mm -hmm. in addressing the problem of plastic, and in what ways um, uh, organization like yours and others can collab uh, collaborate with WTO to, to tackle that problem, and uh, also the Climate Change uh, Summit is uh, COP26 is happening, and. Uh, what are the increasingly hot topic? I mean, this plastic <laughs> is, is really getting hot. And so what way do you think that the new plastic economy is compatible with the target of address, addressing the uh, climate change uh, that uh, also the green economy that we're, we're promoting? Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brickback, uh, your turn, please. Well, thank you so much. A great, a great set of questions. Um, <clears throat> the first one to say, just on the question of the role of the WTO and environment, I think that one of the most exciting things in the last 18 months is despite all of the geopolitical tensions and the challenges that the WTO faces that we've seen the environment is one area around which governments are willing to cooperate and talk. At MC12, we're likely to have a, a ministerial statement on trade and environmental sustainability, which currently has 53 co-sponsors and um, hopefully we'll get more and more, hopefully up to 100 in time for the ministerial statement. And the exciting thing about that, it has a diversity of the, of the, um, the WTO's membership behind it. At the same time, we have this very complementary effort specifically on plastics, this draft ministerial statement as Ambassador Blackman mentioned. They have 18 co-sponsors at the moment, but I know there are a number of countries that are planning to join. And hopefully we can have, you know, at least 50 or 60 countries also agreeing to cooperate and co-sponsor that initiative um, at MC12. So for me, a key task that groups like mine and stakeholders and businesses around the world is to really encourage governments uh, to join up um, these efforts. And I, I mean, I think we should really, um, you know, there is a role. I mean, as as you know, Dr. Wang and I, you're in a, a think tank, and I'm in a university, and we helped spur these discussions back, you know, 18 months ago, and put them on the agenda. And there's a huge role for companies like Nestle, for organisations like yours, the um, the All China Environmental Federation, to really bring this issue. And also, I think, I mean, I was really inspired by your comments, Dr. Zhang, is to show that there's so much work going on nationally. And sometimes people fail to understand how much work there is underway in the business sector, in environmental ministries, among environmental organizations in really trying to shift this. And so in a way, the, the key is for the WTO to catch up and for trade policies and rules to catch up. But I, I think it's really exciting in the case of the work at the WTO that we have a really diverse group of countries that, um, you know, the, the co-sponsors, Barbados, Morocco, China, Fiji, Ecuador and Australia. I mean, we have one of the world's leading producers of plastics willing to take, put this forward, put forward this issue. That's an amazing thing in and of itself and something that we should really cheer for in my view. Um, so just super quickly, um, I wanted to, I finally worked out how to share my 
screen and I just I'm just going to put up the screen I won't talk through it all um but this is how specifically cooperation could help at the WTO um I've tried to put in here um just some boxes of different things that could be done one is to promote trade in goods and services that can reduce plastic pollution so this includes opportunities in environmental sound waste management technologies non-plastic substitutes so these are all um really important whether these are um could be uh, paper products, but also natural fiber products that many developing countries have a competitive advantage in. It can also be to facilitate trade in those recycled and recyclable plastics that we do, or reusable ones that we do want to see more, um, you know, um, be more dominant. We can also use the WTO to help countries align trade policies with their national um, plastic pollution policies. A key thing, in my view, is you shouldn't export what you restrict or ban domestically. And currently, there are many countries. Um, including the EU, for example, that is quite advanced in terms of restricting or banning certain single use plastics domestically, but these are still exported abroad. Um, and a second is really to make sure that we share experiences and support the efforts of countries to implement the Basel Convention and end trade in hazardous mixed and contaminated plastic waste. But we also try and facilitate the trade in recyclable, truly recyclable products that we can show are destined for certified environmentally sound recycling facilities and also recycle. So we want to be able to build, we want to make that recycle economy more competitive as well. I think the governments could pledge voluntary pledges to reduce unnecessary and excessive plastic packaging associated with international trade, to find ways to work with companies um, to do that to coordinate around their um, policies around plastic packaging um, and extended producer responsibility schemes. Um, a, a further thing is, as, um, as Jody mentioned, they can support the development of international standards and labeling for plastics, um, and also to develop classifications that can help governments better monitor um, and businesses better monitor and regulate their own trade. Of course, Ambassador Backman mentioned the green aid for trade agenda, ensuring countries have the assistance that they need. And I think a key thing that all of our partners at the WTO have really focused on, the partner governments have focused on, is the need to cooperate with other international processes um, at UNEA, the Basel Convention, and also other processes within the WTO, um, such as the, this wider ministerial statement, which is going to look at circularity. Um, yeah, and then finally, I had this, you know, that there's, there's work to be done, obviously, to increase transparency of policies, to look at challenges of technology transfer, improve transparency of subsidies to fossil fuel feedstocks. And this is where I think we link back to Dr. Wang's point around the carbon challenge. Of course, the plastics economy is one of the most carbon intensive in the world, the chemical sector. And so part of the effort to shift the plastics economy will also be about decarbonizing it. And that relates also to our solutions around waste management. We need to make sure that they are decarbonizing um, as well. So I'll stop there. I'm sure I've spoken too long, Dr. Wang, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Caroline, at, uh, for your excellent uh, uh, talk as well. I mean, this uh, slide is also quite uh, impressive to, to highlight all the issues. Uh, now, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Zhang, you know, since we're uh, not having much time left, and uh, you are also an expert on the circular economy and, and uh, carbon reduction and plastic recycling. So uh, maybe you can, you know, see what, what they are the, uh, uh, the the WTO uh, you know have its interest in each country so but I think Caroline was really uh, mentioned there's quite a number of countries now have the same uh, minded uh, uh, you know objective and then really to uh, towards the same objective of this in, you know tackling this issue and uh, so what do you think about uh, uh, China's tension and also from your point of view uh, Dr. Dr. Zhang please. Yeah, um, I think now because uh, there are uh, huge uh, these uh, uh, countries and uh, a lot of business is going on. I think uh, technically, uh, every many companies are making efforts, and we see a lot of uh, already uh, technologies and the cases uh, close loop are, are going on. So now uh, I think we need to really have a, a more overall uh, comprehensive model and really can promote this uh, circular economy. I think now these uh, for circular economy, uh, it's still how to empower the recycling sector as uh, to build up the infrastructure for the recycling part. Uh, before in the past, uh, several decades, we're all making efforts in having this uh, production infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, but didn't have much uh, this uh, recycling, the, the, the uh, end part of this uh, infrastructure. So now I think uh, 
we are working on now, even like for biodegradable, I use uh, no these uh, fossil fuel. It's also China is the largest uh, industry now in the world, I think over millions of tons already. So uh, we, we need to see uh, the impact of uh, these uh, material to the environment and to the resources and to the carbon uh, climate change. Uh, so standards and labels uh, are all very important uh, to really can be compared uh, with among all different business and different trade, because otherwise it's very hard to compare uh, the uh, environment impact and the resource uh, efficiency. Uh, so now we are working on these uh, as a uh, collaborating with the uh, national and international climate change policies and really to have um, more standards and labels and also in, uh, involve consumers uh, with labeling, which uh, is also very important uh, for uh, circular economy because uh, in the linear economy, consumers are not involved, but for circular economy, consumers will be the key uh, players. So to tell them the information, deliver the information to consumers are very crucial. So I think standards and labels uh, will be the starting point uh, for our next step. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang. And uh, we have only uh, two or three minutes left, maybe two minutes. Uh, Jolie, uh, what's your uh, final take on, on the issues and also the question we, we talked about? So my, my final take would be there, there's action we can take today and then there's longer term action that we have to build together between government, business and civil society. I'd say on, on the short, short term, every government can act to say we want to start separation of our waste. We separate out organic waste and facilitate composting. We, on an industrial level or a municipal scale, we separate out paper. So all that valuable fiber of which many countries can produce and trade goes into fiber and paper recycling, whether that's going to be new paper boxes or other fiber-based materials. And then the recyclables are left. Um, another perspective would be, how can we use the trade system through, similar to how other trade agreements have acted, identifying certain products that should certainly have no tariffs applied to them, and those would be products related to reuse and products related to recycling. Because if we look at the big picture of getting to only 1.5 degree increases by 2050 with our Paris commitments, we have a challenge. And if we go to reuse and every package can be used 10 or 20 times, that's a 90 to 95% re reduction in the total recycling infrastructure that we need to build. If every package lives 10 or 20 lives before it gets recycled and becomes another material. And so my reflection would be to support reuse systems, we need to support infrastructure and also service jobs. And those jobs are in washing, bottling, labeling, and reverse logistics. And when we look to reverse logistics, there's a whole world of opportunity to go to either electric transportation, green hydrogen-based transportation, and create all of those jobs in the ecosystem to enable us to move to packaging that maybe heavier than plastic, like paper or glass okay. or metal, but ultimately we... support the circular economy. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And I think we, we are really running out of time. And I mean, I know they're going to cut us off right, right away on time. So I think the international community has established a framework of regulating processing of plastic waste and to minimize pl plastic pollution in the past 50 years. And so, so I think our discussion today is really highly relevant. I think it's another a uh, step forward to really promoting this issue. And then actually, uh, I think we had all the experts from uh, Ambassador uh, Blackman, also uh, uh, Dr. Brick, <laughs> Brickback, and also uh, Dr. Zhang, and uh, uh, also Ms. Uh, uh, Ros Rosell. And so it's great discussion. So we hope that we can get more government consensus, old NGO, old industries, and think tanks, we can work together to really promoting this uh, objective of reach the consensus. So MC12 is coming up and uh, we hope that uh, we can really play more active role uh, to promoting uh, more, uh, minimize the plastic use and, and sustainable 